But when we empower women, when we allow them yes. to flourish, when we give them a seat at the table, when we educate them, um, women don't push men down mm. as they rise. Their community rises with them, just that mutual flourishing that we talked about before. Yeah. So, you know, when we teach a woman to read, we know that we teach you know, somewhere around about five or six or even seven or eight other people to read because a woman teaches her children to read and she teaches her sisters to read. She teaches her community to read. And if he'll let her, she'll even teach her husband to read. (laughs) But when we teach a man to read, he tends not to teach anybody else. So we just teach the one person. Welcome to Justice Matters the podcast inspiring a world where everyone belongs. I'm your host, Tim Buxton. G'day and welcome to another episode of Justice Matters. It's a joy to have Melissa Lipset with me on the episode today. Uh, We just got done having a great chat and talking about um, many issues that are dear to her heart. Melissa is the newly appointed COO of Baptist World Aid that are doing a phenomenal work to try and alleviate poverty around the world. And uh, they're doing great work right now in in the Papua New Guinea crisis, which we talk a little bit about now, as they're uh, being severely impacted by COVID in the minute. Uh, We talk about issues around uh, women's inequality and the power there is when we elevate and serve and... and, and, um, provide economic empowerment towards women in our world and and we talk about that issue quite a bit and maybe a lot of the shortcomings that institutions like the church have had in regards to women's inequality. Guys, uh, she's a a wonderful, wonderful person that I have had the privilege of knowing for a number of years now and I know you're going to really love um, hearing from her. Uh, As with all my guests, I learn so much and I hope you'll get the chance to learn from her today too. Thanks for listening. First of all, congratulations on your new role as the Chief Operating Officer at Baptist World Aid. Um, I think you're the perfect candidate. I'm sure they're they're realising that too. But can you give us a bit of a um, yeah overview of what who Baptist World Aid is? and a bit about what they do and focus on. Yeah, sure, Tim. Well, yeah, I'm thrilled to be with Baptist World Aid, and I feel like this is this role is an alignment of um, purpose and passion for me, so it's a really a sweet spot. Uh, Baptist World Aid is an expression of the Baptist Church in Australia, uh, and really it says, you know, faith is not just about our personal relationship with Jesus, but it's about us having a a transforming relationship with the world. And uh, we want to have that transforming relationship with the world, with the most vulnerable Mm. of people. And so Baptist World Aid works in, uh, it it believes in fullness of life for Mm. everybody. And so we work to bring that in places where it doesn't currently exist. Mm. Uh, And there's some foundational principles there um, that obviously come from uh, the Christian faith. Yeah. Uh, you know, we would expect that as Baptist World Aid, um, but um, but we don't just work um, in a, a in faith areas. We work with the most uh, marginalised people in the world, very much the the least of these, mm-hmm. um, with that very great belief that uh, fullness of life should be available for all. Yeah. And, you know, we prob- we live in a day and age right now where we are so much more aware of the poverty and, and suffering of our neighbours. I think we, see, we, we, we tapped into the news. We know glo- there's global events that, that just remind us on a day-to-day basis. That's yeah, so that's many right. And I think that's a, that's a good thing. I think in the past that we thought the world is very vast and the choices that I make um, mm. Don't have, um, don't make a difference for other people. They don't make a difference for the environment. But we actually know that's not the case now. And somebody just asked me yesterday, whose fault is it? Uh, whose wow. fault is poverty? And I said, well, actually, 
It's everybody's it's all fault. All of ours, yes. Absolutely, because I take too much. I use too much. And when I do that, it has an effect, a negative effect on somebody else. It has a negative effect on the environment. And that degradation in the environment has a negative effect on somebody else. So it, it's we can't. We can't say it's not our responsibility. This is everybody's responsibility. And, you know, from a faith perspective, and you'd expect me to come from that sure. perspective, but, you know, I absolutely believe in equality for all, mm. equal responsibility for all, and equal provision for all. I really believe that that was, uh, you know, that's, that, that comes straight, that's the biblical foundation. Mm. You know, those are biblical principles. And so when we think about those, you know, some of us are not meant to be hugely better off than others. Mm. There is supposed to be uh, enough for everybody. And there actually is There actually is, is right? Yeah. There is, yeah. That's the thing. And, um, uh, you know, it's about, it's, about unjust systems mm. and unjust policies and and power that's used inappropriately mm. that we end up with this but we can't abdicate responsibility for all that for some to somebody else mm. so i make it very personal for people i say mm. yes I'm responsible and you're responsible. If you've ever taken too much, if you've ever used too much, if you've ever wasted anything, then we are all responsible at some level. Yeah. And I would say um, th that that responsibility, that ability to say, hey, look, if I'm responsible, then I must obviously um, – be called into action to do something about it. And it always, and sometimes the the, the issues th that we're faced with seem insurmountable, so big for one individual, but there are, it is, I find, reorientating our daily lives towards that, that end, as well as obviously tackling big issues, which is where organisations like Baptist World Aid collectively can then use that, that um, collective you know, power of the people to make significant changes and advancements in society. Absolutely. Um, the Ethical Fashion Guide is a really good example of that. About mm. 10 years ago, Baptist World Aid started to put together information about um, fashion in Australia and uh, started to talk to fashion companies about how they produce their garments. Uh, it's a huge industry. Sure. And um, particularly for women, we, you know, most of us love fashion. And so uh, now we have um, produced every year something called the Ethical Fashion Guide, which allows Australian consumers to look at a brand before they purchase it and work and they can see whether that um, article of clothing has been produced in an ethical way and what we're really looking there for there is a um, a fair wage a living wage yeah. for the person at the end of that supply chain and there's some other things along there uh, away along the way as well but essentially we're looking for you know end to, from one end of the supply yeah. chain to the other is the person getting getting a living wage. And the reality is that our purchasing decisions can change that. Yes. And we know that over the last 10 years, that work that we've been doing in that space has changed the behaviour of Australian companies around how they source and where they source uh, fashion garments from, or indeed, um, you know, uh, that advocacy has gone into um, achieving better outcomes yes. for those fashion workers. So that's a really simple thing that every single person in Australia, yep. whoever buys a T-shirt, <laughs> whoever buys a new dress, whoever buys a pair of jeans, can can they can make a difference in yeah. the way that they make that purchase. Yeah, and it, like you've kind of alluded to it, um, not only does it help the consumer make the right decision and 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 uh, 
But what it is doing is it's holding a com- a companies to account. And until they feel like they're being held to account, they're not going to change their practices. And that then no. has a ripple effect on the industries as a whole. It might not just be the fashion industry. It will be all companies that are realising, hey, we're being held to account for our uh, carbon emissions now. We, we've got to yes. prove that it's not just profit, but it's planet and it's people and our impact on that that matters as well. So you're right. Yes. And we've seen companies realise that this is good business sense. Mm -hmm. It's not just um, about, uh, you know, a better supply chain. It is good business sense for Mm. them. And Australian consumers are now actually looking for an ethical fashion um, uh, tag on their garments. Mm. And if you, if I speak to the average um, woman in Australia who likes to go shopping and I say to them, would you be prepared to pay a little bit more knowing that the woman or the man who's made that garment is going to be able to receive a living wage? They say, yes, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but so the next time you know you see a really cheap item of clothing, you have to ask yourself: It's so cheap. Is you know how is that being produced? Yeah. And what's the person who's producing it getting paid? And you know, but you can you can check um, our ethical fashion guide, right. uh, and it and it lists dozens and dozens of companies in Australia and they have changed their behaviour. We rate them every year and their ratings have changed. Oh, that's phenomenal. Um, yeah, what, a shout out to my good friend James Bartle who founded Outland Denim and a certified B um, uh, um, jeans company, denim company, that is has done phenomenal um, work and is leading the way in, in a lot of those efforts and and as I talk with him and 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 just see the impact it's having on the lives of uh, the workers from the very you know from those that are that not only getting a living wage but are then being trained through their program to how to live a full health healthy life and to care for their children and, and providing education for their kids it's it's so well worth paying a little bit of extra to make sure that you know you can not only yeah. provide a living wage, but business. And we've had a lot of like social enterprises kind of come in on this podcast that business actually can be a part of the solution to ending poverty. It doesn't have to be, well, there's just the, the capitalist business uh, element over there and we've just got to, um, you know, kind of wipe that out and kind of somehow move to, to this. But we can actually utilize the power of 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 creating products that we all love and need on a day-to-day basis that can have a a, a real huge social impact so yeah yeah it's really great to see and we're uh thrilled to be a part of that Mm. so that's obviously one of the one of the main areas that that um baptist world aid has led the way in in providing that a fashion ethical guide um what are, what are some of the other kind of um, ma- major initiatives that you guys have going on at the moment? Yeah, well, we we participate in a range of advocacy issues uh, along with other great organisations in Australia. So, for instance, we're a part of MICA, mm. uh, which uh, works to advocate to the Australian government around things like our international aid budget Mm. and really important stuff like that, how our taxpayer dollars get spent. Mm. And uh, so so there's a a number of advocacy um, planks to our work, but we also participate in community development. So we believe in, uh, as I said before, fullness of life for everybody and for, and, and, that really looks like economic dignity. Mm. And so we work in places with, um, you know, the poorest places in, on the planet um, with the most vulnerable people in the world. And most of our work is in Southeast Asia. Mm. Uh, we do some work in Africa and the Middle East also. Yeah. But we look at those really vulnerable groups of people and um, we certainly work in disaster, relief and recovery um, um, and uh, and in fact, we're doing a lot of pre work in disaster avoidance mm. uh, or 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 disaster resilience, I guess. Sure. Uh, 
um, not avoidance, but resilience, um, to building community structures to help people become more resilient when and if there is a disaster. But we certainly respond um, uh, when there is a, a natural disaster. And at the moment, we're responding around um, Papua New Guinea, yeah. for instance, the COVID um, crisis. We, we've... Um, uh, we've particularly chosen to work uh, with uh, with hospitals, Baptist hospitals in PNG, yeah. to be providing sufficient PPE to keep those hospitals open and operating. And we envisage being in PNG through COVID um, response for quite some time to come. The situation's really it's bad. It's devastating. You, maybe you could explain yeah. for our listeners what's going on, because um, in Australia right now we have it's just, it's almost a non non-issue for m- most of Australians I won't say everybody but yeah that's but right. uh, but in comparison yeah maybe give some yeah. insight there well, PNG are amongst our nearest neighbours and um, at the start of the pandemic a year ago there um, they they did very well at containing the virus but um, through a variety of factors that now they are very much in a catastrophic wave. Mm. Um, we don't know what the percentage of people with um, COVID is because, you know, rates of testing aren't as high as, as they are in Australia and we know that things like social distancing are, are much, much higher harder to achieve um, just in terms of the way people live um, their normal lives. Uh, and, and there's not the same level of uh, education or availability of PPE. Sure. So, for instance, we do have hospitals who are at risk of um, uh, closing through lack of PPE. So we've been able to come alongside them and, and provide uh, that. You know, sometimes it's not about PPE not being available in country. It's about whether the hospital or the organisation can afford that PPE. Um, wow. So, uh, you know, and, and so that comes back to, you know, making resources available so people can access what's actually there. Wow. Um, and so uh, if you look at, um, for instance, the major hospital in, um, in Port, Port Moresby, Moresby yeah. last week, they tested um, women in, who were in the maternity um, ward there. And over half of those women had COVID. And, uh, you know, there wasn't even anywhere to separate them from women who tested um, negative to COVID. Mm. So we don't know what the real rates are. We just know that rates are rising and rising rapidly um, and people are dying. Mm. Well, it's it's great to know that that you guys are able to respond and um, we know that there has been a, a... in, in large, uh, a positive response. I know recently, um, but again, we can all do. We can all do more. We can we can talk about these issues more and, and recognise that this, you know, this is um, something that, um, yeah. It, it yeah, no, that's for sure. I think so much of this is about education and mm. awareness, and um, we've seen the Australian government respond. Um, uh, really well in these last couple of weeks with mm. um, commitments of vaccines into PNG and um, as we speak there's a, um, a contingent of military personnel um, uh, or actually it's a, it's a contingent of medical personnel they were taken there mm. uh, by the military so you know we have swung into action um, and we're really grateful that the government has stepped up to do that mm. um, and uh, and we've been absolutely so encouraged by um, our donors and supporters who've put their hands in their pockets to provide PPE for hospitals um, mm. you know we launched an appeal about that a couple of weeks ago and that's just um, been incredibly successful, far more than successful than we might have envisaged, which will allow us Amazing. to continue, um, you know, throughout the relief effort over a long period of time. Yeah. Let me tell you about one of our partners, Freedom Broadband. They're an incredible profit for purpose business. Freedom Broadband is your all in one internet and telephone service provider whether it's for your business or your home. Now their internet connection and speeds are simply amazing and they're in another league when it comes to the quality of their customer service. 
But here's what really sets them apart. When you switch to any of their services, they'll donate $5 every month to a non-profit cause of your choice. As the founder of You Belong, an Australian-based non-profit charity, one of the greatest challenges we face is fundraising. And I think I can speak for almost all leaders in the non-profit world when I say that being able to have a residual income coming into your accounts to support your work is a dream come true. And like most nonprofits, our work is dependent on the generous support of individuals and groups that share our passion to empower refugees to integrate and thrive here in Australia. What that means is that we spend more time and energy looking for ways to raise support. And what I desperately love to be doing is spending that time and our limited resources developing and growing the many successful programs that we run. But here's where our friends at Freedom Broadband come in. You see, a few months back, I was on a 4G wireless connection at home through one of the largest phone and internet companies here in Australia. And each month I was nervous about going over our usage, getting a nasty bill at the end. And I was working on a lot of the podcasting and videos at home and the speeds I was getting were just painfully debilitating. And I finally decided to give Freedom Broadband a call And within two minutes, I was on the call with Graham completing my application. And within a week, I had completely switched over to their $79 a month unlimited plan. And I can tell you firsthand, the service has been phenomenal. And I have a direct line to their customer service team whenever I have a question or need assistance. Now the studio and office where I work has switched over to Freedom Broadband as well. We're on their business plan and we haven't looked back. And how cool is this? Little by little, connection by connection, Aussie-owned and locally run Freedom Broadband is now actively supporting the great work of non-profits in communities all around Australia. Simply by switching your internet to Freedom Broadband, you can help transform the lives of those less fortunate. And that's why I love these guys. Get this, head to freedombroadband.com.au and quote Justice Matters on your application form and they will donate $50 from the activation fee to support Justice Matters. That's going to enable us to continue this podcast and inspire the world where everyone belongs. That's freedombroadband.com.au. Say goodbye to expensive, mediocre internet with poor customer service and hello to top-notch internet service and the good feeling of knowing you're supporting a great cause. Join Freedom Broadband today. Quote Justice Mattis and let's partner together with the internet that's helping to change the world. You know, it kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier about this, this, the world being so much smaller and being so much more interconnected. You know, when we, when we help, when we come to the aid, when we come to the, the service of those in need in the long run, believe it or not, because we are, interconnected and we don't do it just because it benefits us but we are all benefit as a process when our neighbors are doing well we do well and yeah. and it's 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 i think it's sometimes just that awareness that hey it's we kind of get fear sends us into a panic i, I think right now with you know the availability of vaccines everyone's trying to grab for themselves thinking if i just get for me it's going to be okay but actually do you understand that having everyone vaccinated actually is what's going to help us all and that ability to understand that that um we we we've got to work together in these things and the temptation is to go to our little tribes to go to our little communities and to kind of take care of ourselves but i think that the real call is to hey no let's stretch beyond that beyond the fear and in, in of service of others yeah, that's right. And I mean, you and I both know from our interactions with, um, uh, you know, people uh, who are very different from us that mm. when when you when you're in relationship with somebody else, you the the differences fade away. Yes. And you know, you look into the eyes of another human being, and all you see is another human being, and and gender. I love and, that. Um, 
uh, you know, faith basis and so many things, just uh, cultural um, differences, they all just fade away when you connect with yes. another human being. And the more that we can do that, and we realise there's this mutual exchange and mutual flourishing. Yes. It's not about us providing for somebody else and not getting anything back. The exchange is both ways. It's you so know, we've true. got so much to learn yes. from each other. Uh, and, uh, you know, yes, we're able to provide resources, but but as we reach out and engage with other people, you know, there it's very much a mutual exchange and, and hugely beneficial all round. It's that mutual flourishing that we rise together. Yeah, we rise, exactly, yeah. It's almost a, yeah. Um, it's like, I heard it's put, put this way, you know, uh, there's a ladybug that, that lands on my hand, that ladybug doesn't know that it's an Australian ladybug. <laughs> it's it's a ladybug, you know? You know what I mean? It's like it doesn't have this yeah. awareness of I'm and what makes me Australian or American or Papua New Guinean. Like sometimes we are overly aware of our, our specificity of who we are that we forget, like you said, we are all just human at the end of the day. And if we could yeah. all just embrace and love one another and, and care for one another with that same sense of awareness, um, anyways, it, yeah, it would be... And- you know, it's such a, you know, it's a responsibility to do that, but it's also such a privilege. Mm. I, I have such incredible relationships with people right around the world. And, you know, my life is so much uh, fuller because of those relationships. You know, it, it's, you know, they are life-giving relationships. Mm-hmm. And um, I feel incredibly fortunate to have had those experiences. But the reality is that, you know, um, there are people in our street who are very different from us. There yeah. are people in our apartment blocks who are very different to us. But but if we connect together, if we look into each other's eyes, if we seek to understand and each other and care for each other, so much of that difference melts away. Yeah, so well said. And... Um, maybe we could take a little pivot here and turn maybe to talk towards some of the more difficult challenges and issues. Um, and I was, you know, there's this sense of when we act in compassion towards those in need, there's an act of mercy, you could say, and, and, and we're called to be people of mercy and act in compassion and help. Um, but there is there is a slight difference when we talk about this idea of acting injustice because mercy will say, hey, I help you in, in the state of suffering or need or pain that you have, but true justice asks the question why and what is the system or what are the reasons for you getting into this situation in the first place, right? What are the, why why is are you poor and in, in systemic poverty in the first place? And how can we make sure that we aren't just like putting a Band-Aid on issues, putting a Band-Aid on, on problems? I love how you talked about building disaster resiliency because that's not about build, putting a Band-Aid and, and, and aid, which is often very much needed in, in the height of a crisis or a pandemic or, a, or an emergency. You do need to provide emergency aid in those situations. But how do we develop you know, um, resiliency, how do we address some of the issues and root causes of those things? And and maybe you could talk a bit into to some of that. Um, what are some of the maybe injustices or issues that are more dear to your heart um, as well? Yeah, sure, Tim. Um, well, I mean, the, the one that's very dear to my heart is around, um, the, around women, around yep. gender. And I have seen women be such incredible agents for change in their communities yes. that I simply don't understand why we seek to keep women pushed down because women uh, are just, women are incredible. They really mm. are. they uh, and I can't understand why we wouldn't want to empower women at every Chance we stage yep. at every level in society, you, you know, because, uh, you know, they bring a different voice to the table and, uh, 
you know, that's so that diversity of voices is so important as we look at systems and structures. Mm. And, you know, for me, it comes down to, you know, there's there's a power imbalance in our world. Yeah. And and most of that power is held by men. Yes. And it's not women like me who suffer as a result of that. I've had enormous opportunity, but it's women who, um, you know, who a much more impoverished, uh, you know, who live in impoverished situations. Mm. They suffer the most from those imbalances of power because, uh, you know, that power invades every structure of our society. And, uh, you know, the powerful are the ones who, you know, policies are written and structures are set up. Yes. And um, business is done in a way that benefits those who are already powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and and for me, it, you know, um, it, it is a gender issue. And we know that um, women, you know, bear the brunt of those power imbalances um, right around the world. But when we empower women, when we allow them yes. to flourish, when we give them a seat at the table, when we educate them, um, women don't push men down mm. as they rise. Their community rises with them, just that mutual flourishing that we talked about before. Yeah. So, you know, when we teach a woman to read, we know that we teach teach you know somewhere around about five or six or even seven or eight other people to read because a woman teaches her children to read and she teaches her sisters to read she teaches her community to read and wow. if he'll let her she'll even teach her husband to read <laughs> but when we teach a man to read he tends not to teach anybody else mm. so we just teach the one person but and and that um, you know, that happens not just in literacy, of course, but it happens in every part of a woman's life. She She's the, you know, predominant carer of children, for instance, around the world. So, you know, she seeks to, you know, to bring her children up with her. Yeah. She seeks when she is educated, she wants educated for education for her. Actually, even if she's not education educated, she wants education for her children. Um, and so I think that communities benefit when women flourish. And so I love the fact that um, I get to work, um, at, you know, the organisations that I've been working with in recent years, mm. uh, we, we do focus on... Um, on community development uh, with women and by extension with children because there's so much yeah. there's so much impact when we do that there's a multiplier effect yeah I love the way you, you've explained that um, I know that's definitely I've, I've read a lot about um, organizations the Bill Gates Foundation that have have, fo have spent a lot of time researching and putting focus on ec um, you know economic empowerment especially of women Um and um and yeah it's it's um it's uh, the, it's humbling to see you know i have a wonderful wife myself who i've witnessed the way that she has served our family and served us the things that she's able to do that i know i could never never uh, um do um and uh yeah it's just amazing that you've put that um not only um brought that towards us oh, maybe we'll touch on it a little bit um because I feel like this, especially in, in both you and I have a, uh, a, 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 a very much an affection and a love for local churches. We've spent a lot of time working in them and serving in them. But unfortunately, it has been an area maybe that even the church has l in so many ways lagged behind. Um, yes, and, don't and get I, me started. Well, well, you know, I do <laughs> want to because this – it's about having the conversations and that we don't always want to have. Uh, how are we going to be educated and learn unless we we realise that, hey, um, these are systemic issues, even maybe within our own communities, that we can so often have a blind spot to. But, um, yeah, yeah, let's go and there. I think, um, you know, a couple of years ago when the Me Too movement started, 
I felt desperate sadness because I really thought that the church, that should have been the church's moment in history Mm. Um, because the church has the biblical mandate for equality, uh, including gender equality. And so we should have been able to say to society, to community, look at us, look at the way we do this, look at the way we mutually um, uh, you know, which which men and women mutually flourish side by side. Uh, but we couldn't no. because, you know, we've got it so, we've done it so badly within the church that we've actually re- become irrelevant to the conversation. Community right. thinks that we haven't got anything relevant to add to it because we're so far behind. But we should able to lead the way and I think that's an absolute tragedy for the church that we have now dropped a long way behind Uh, and uh, so I'm really passionate about um, dismantling those quite frankly I think power structures within the church that seek to perpetuate that inequality um, mm. of men and women's voices. Now, some churches are better at it than others. It's You know, it's you can't a, group a, everybody into the same no, basket, no, but, so, but it, it is, you know, by yeah. and large an issue that needs to be addressed. And, and look, I hear that some people, you know, will argue very strongly that it's a theological issue, but I just don't think it is. Um, I think that... Uh, you know, when we look at the whole mosaic of Scripture right. and we look at those foundational statements about um, people being made equally in, in the image of God, man and woman being made equally in the image of God, we just can't dress it up as anything else. Yeah. You know, God is interested in equality. Mm-hmm. He's interested in responsibility. He's interested in provision for all, you know, and, and they build one on top of the other. Equality, equal responsibility, provision for all, mm-hmm. you know, you just can't get away from it. So I, I'm really passionate about that. And, you know, probably probably as I get older, I speak out more strongly about it because I see so many incredible young women who um, who are not being given the opportunity to uh, to have their voices counted and and I I really think it's not just about them suffering when women don't have their voices heard they suffer yes it's true but I think their children suffer and their partners mm. suffer their husbands suffer certainly their communities suffer and by extension the world suffers. So I just, you know, I, I, the older I get, the more mm-hmm. passionate I get about saying, you know, we have to make space for young women uh, to bring their voices to the table. And, and look, I, I do hear a lot of men saying, oh, yes, we, we want to champion young women. And I say, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic that you want to champion them. And that certainly happened for me. I've been championed by men. But then there's the next step of that is to make space for them. And to make space for those voices, some men will have to step away. Mm-hmm. You can't, you know, there's no, there's no doubt in my mind that that means some men stepping back and that's where the rubber really hits the road it's i'm prepared to champion women but i'm am i prepared to sponsor them and step back myself to enable one of them to step forward and i believe that as we do that we will see the mutual um, benefit for all as we do that yeah you remind you remind me when just the word empowerment, right? When we want to champion or empower somebody, it means those with power must give up their power to give it to somebody else so that they can be elevated and empowered. That's and exactly right. And so I that we, it can't happen without that, one or the other, right? That's exactly right, yeah. And we, we tend to bristle when we talk about the power word. Mm. Um, but I think it's really important that we name it as that. Yeah, a hundred percent. And um, well, I'm I'm th- thankful for the way you have been such a shining. I think an example to many people uh, of 
serving in leadership in various capacities. Um, and, it, and I'm sure there's been some challenges along the way, <laughs> some lessons learnt um, in your various roles in both coming from the a, a military background in you know to towards a more church um, background various organizations non-profit organizations are there any I mean I'm sure you could share some of the challenge challenges which you've already kind of maybe alluded to already but what what advice and what lessons have you learned from some of the difficulties that you've you've faced with over the years Oh, if I had all of those years over again, um, how differently might I do some things? Um, I did come out of a military background, uh, and I think that uh, you you come out of the military with a particular style, um, mm. or I did, and I think that style has changed a lot over the years, and I'm I'm grateful for that. But I'm I'm grateful for that military foundation. So I think I've been able to bring. Um, a, a very focused um, but pastoral leadership mm. um, to the way I lead now. Um, so so probably I lead very differently to the way I might have, say, 30-odd years ago, um, and, and I'm glad of that, and I'm sure those people that I serve are, are, are glad of that. But, but honestly, I do believe in servant leadership first and foremost, mm. that should, as we lead, it should be always about the people that we're leading and their well-being and their opportunities and, uh, you know, outcomes for them. I think that, uh, you know, um, we think of leadership as being a bit glamorous, but it shouldn't be at all. It Mm. should always be focused on the other. Mm. And so I think I've got better at that as the years have gone by. And it, I, I genuinely believe that it's a privilege to serve other people. And as a leader, I want to be known for serving other people. I don't mm. want to be known for anything else, really. Mm. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Um, how how would how would your husband describe Melissa? Just so we can get a <laughs> bit bit behind the. The you know un- unveil a bit more of who Melissa is to our, our guest this morning. What would what would he say about you? Uh, look, I think there's no question that I'm task focused and biased towards action. Yeah, and you know I can want to move quite fast with that, and you know I probably I'm probably more gentle with my team. Um, than I am with with my family, um, so he he might be he might roll his eyes a bit, and, and <laughs> you know he's been known to say happy wife happy life, uh. <laughs> but look he's a leader in his own right uh, mm. and uh, and a very uh, effective and proficient leader, and you know we've probably got better together over a 40 year period but yeah look it, you know there's there's no question that we probably uh you know we save our uh we save our our worst behavior for our family um but you know we've been together for a, a, a long period of time now we've been together for over 40 years married for 38 wow and uh and yeah it it's um it's a very it's a robust relationship we're both passionate about um about what we do and how we do it but we have really shared values so those those foundations are the same in both of us so i think we really appreciate that in each other but um yeah i mean on the average day he'd probably tell me to slow down a little bit and and take a bit more care around him right quite the uh, maybe overachiever and 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 in in one res- in some respects maybe or uh, I I just like to spin a lot of plates at once yeah. you know uh, I'm, I'm energized by that and you know not not everybody is to the same extent and you know I think I I do expect a lot of mm. other people I expect a lot of myself mm. and I but I do expect a lot of other people as well um, and I think that, um, you know, but if you appreciate people, I think they're really up for that. And yeah. I think the work uh, that 
you know, we don't get very long on this planet. Sure. And I do want to make a difference. Yeah. And in the short time that I, in the relatively short time that I've got left, I really, yeah. you know, I, I really do want to make a difference. So, yeah, I have high energy for, you know, for the things that I'm passionate about. Uh, and, and, the, and we are also grateful for that because you have everywhere you've gone, you've left an incredible impact. And I love the way that right now in this season, as, as you were sharing with me on a um, previous chat we have, you, your husband is really championing you in this season of your life. Like you said, he's been a, le- a leader in as a pilot within Qantas and, and has um, obviously um, taken the time now to say, you know what? Yeah, we're going to follow you, Melissa, and where you go. And and, um, yeah. and to have no, a husband that's championed you in that way must be uh, something you're so thankful yeah, for. Yeah, no, Pete has always championed me and, uh, you know, and I've seen him champion our daughter too. Mm. And, you know, that's fantastic to watch a dad do that for his daughter. Um, but, yeah, I'm incredibly grateful to Peter. I couldn't be doing what I do now without his support. And, and quite frankly, I couldn't have done 20 years of mm. Um, church leadership without his support and and without the family's support. I mean, uh, you know, 20 years of, of a large um, church, you know, it's a big engine to keep turning. Oh, my goodness, and, yeah. Uh, you know, my family was phenomenal. I invested 20 years of their lives in, in the local church and, you know, they were incredibly gracious about that and, you mm. um, yeah, you know, my husband, you know, my mum, my kids. Yeah, we've stayed on in Sydney for me to do this role long past the time when we thought that we might have gone home to Queensland to be with, you know, my kids, my adult kids yeah. and um, and and my older parents. But, you know, they've been and incredibly gracious about allowing us to stay and encouraging us to do that, encouraging me in particular to mm. follow my passions. And I'm incredibly grateful to Pete and the family for that yeah uh, there, there's so many sacrifices especially in, in church pastoral leadership and in and in the work that you're doing now that a lot of people don't see and to have to to come come through decades of, of that um, and to to be strong and healthy and ready for the next challenge um, is probably a testimony to that support now you mentioned that you have shared values and one of my questions I wanted to ask you was what what are what would you say is a core value that you that you possess um, in your life that drives you and what you do? What if you had to pick one um, or something that yeah yeah for us it's got to be our Christian faith mm. that we we do truly believe the same things. And, you know, we didn't always, uh, we weren't Christians when we got married um, and I became a Christian soon after we were married and, um, you know, dragged Pete along to church and, you know, um, God was very kind and gracious and, and, you know, Pete became a Christian also. So that was a very long time ago now. Mm. And, and we both sought to um, genuinely to follow Jesus' call on our life. And for Pete, that was in, you know, um, in, in secular life, no question. Uh, you know, he was a, um international airline pilot. But, you know, I've had people reach out to me even recently to say, I don't know you, Melissa, but I knew your husband when he was flying and he he shared his Christian faith with me and I knew what you both mm. believed in. So he was, uh, you know, when I meet people uh, who Peter's worked with for years and years and years, they tell me that he's the nicest bloke that they've ever met and ever mm. worked with and kind and gracious. And generous, much more so than me, probably. But you know that that Pete would say that comes from uh, that understanding of who we are in Christ, mm. that we are made equally in the image of God. That looking into somebody else's eyes and seeing the face of God in them, mm. and you know that really does um, drive. Pete and I, that is our core value, that we both believe that inherently. Mm. Look, um, yeah, 
when you choose to follow the life and teachings of Jesus, when you reflect on that um, and the way he lived his life and the way he, we've talked about issues of, of women empowerment, we've talked about issues of, of, of those that are, you know, serving the, the, those that are poor, that are sick, that are, that are, are on the outskirts of society. You, I can imagine you cannot truly, sincerely follow him without being like him and being tra- tra- transformed to that end as well. Um, well, it's just love, Tim, at mm, the end of the day. Mm. You know, that I think that at the end of the day, that's what we're called to do for, first and foremost. And, and honestly, love changes everything. Mm. Wow. So simple. I mean, Jesus' love for me changed everything about me and my life. Mm. And, and now I just get to do that out of the for other people out of the overflow of his love for me. Mm. Yeah, I think so often um, we overcomplicate things, don't we? <laughs> we uh, we when it truly is look. Um, yeah, for sure. What is the and, need in know, front of me? We can all love. Mm. We're all capable of that. Yeah. Well, it's been wonderful chatting with you about these. You know the incredible work. Um, I, I love that you're now in a position to to impact a whole, not only the world um, that and those that you're serving, but a whole movement, right? To to challenge them, to beckon them, the the, the Baptist community um, around the world. Uh, you are in a position to be able to say, "Hey, this is what it truly means to live out your faith." And it is yes. to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly before your God, uh, to, t- to steal the words of uh, a, a prophet uh, in the northern part of Israel of many, many centuries ago. Um, that is a great call and a great work that you've been called to. How, how, you know, what are your thoughts when you think of it like that? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, you know, Baptist World Aid Australia is a fairly unique organisation. It doesn't really exist in this um, manner around the rest of the world. And so we're really excited about um, the opportunity to say to 150 million Baptists around the world, hey, how about getting on board with us and doing this sort of work? Can you imagine the difference 150 million Baptists could make wow. um, as they all uh, seek to do, you know, as they all seek to genuinely love their neighbour. Mm. Uh, and um, so, yeah, we're, we're at Baptist World Aid Australia, we're, we're genuinely excited about what we get to do in our own patch, but also about being able to call um, you know, our, our Baptist family around the world to this work. Yeah. Well, uh, I know you've, you've just begun the work. I can't wait to, to see how it all kind of unfolds um, as, you, as, you, as you embark on this wonderful new season of your career and your life. Uh, thanks so much for kind of, uh, yeah, jumping on and sharing your heart with us today. And, um, yeah, it's been really wonderful chatting with you Melissa great to chat with you Tim glad to have you here in Australia and uh, and and love what you do as well thanks for listening to this episode of Justice Matters I'd like to take this time to thank my audio visual engineer Jose Biotto for your help in producing the show I'd also like to shout out to the Patreon community that financially supports this podcast Guys, thank you so much for your support. You can join them simply by going to patreon.com forward slash justice matters for a simple donation of $5 a month. You can become part of the Patreon community and get access to behind the scenes content and extras that I share just with you. And lastly, there is another really important way that you can help support the podcast and that's simply by rating it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify maybe by subscribing on YouTube. Yes, we are a video podcast as well. Guys, thank you so much for listening in to this episode of Justice Matters. Please come again soon. I can't wait to share more episodes with you. 
I'm your host, Tim Buxton. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.